So early on the morning, January morning in 2012, the mother of a 14-year-old girl heard a scratch at the door. She went downstairs thinking it was the dog. And when she opened the door, she found her daughter instead. She was half clothed, sprawled out on the lawn in 20 degree weather. The mother got the story out of her daughter. She'd snuck out the night before, met up with an older boy, a football player from a politically connected family. He gave her alcohol, lots of alcohol, and she didn't remember anything after that. So the mother was suspicious and she was frightened. She went to the sheriff who said he'd look into it. She went to the district attorney who, eventually, who filed two felony charges. And she went to the local papers. And the papers filed what we'll call today here a report. And reports look like this. Classic inverted pyramid of journalism, right? They've got a lead. The most important information goes there. A body, some context, and some background. Nobody really calls it the tail, but it's the bottom. And the point is that if you're a busy editor on deadline, you just cut from the bottom, you won't lose anything key. Now, reports are critical to what we do in the news business. I'm a reporter with the Associated Press in Portland, Oregon. They can tell you about fluctuation in the stock market, a homicide down the street, or a genocide in the Central African Republic. Reports are most of what we produce or most of what you consume. Reports really only keep going as long as something like a process is going, a legal process. And before she knew it, without explanation, mysteriously, the charges that were filed against that boy were dropped. And this woman began to feel the backs of the town turning against her. So she had no charges, she had no outrage, she had no more reports. And then a reporter with the Kansas City Star got a hold of the story. And he went and met with the mom a half dozen times in this small Missouri town. He learned about how when her daughter went to school one day, somebody was wearing a t-shirt, a t-shirt set up like a scoreboard. And it had the girl's name and a zero, and it had the boy's name and a one. He went and tried to talk to the district attorney and he had the, he was hung up on. He had doors closed in his face. He tried to talk to people in town. And he also felt that back turned. Then, the family's house burned down, seriously. So that reporter took what he had seen, what he'd heard, he talked about the closing doors and the t-shirt, talked about a Twitter hashtag that celebrated the release of these guys from, from jail, and he reproduced something that wasn't a report, it's what we'll call today a story. That town is Maryville, Missouri, some of you have heard of it. In fall of 2013, it became the focus of a national firestorm. A special prosecutor was named, charges were filed. It may not have been justice the way the family wanted it, but it was something. And what the reporter did was he took the facts on hand and he connected them to these abstract ideas about justice and freedom and liberty. And that's what stories can do. Because stories give us meaning. They're the harder choice, but they deliver meaning. And I'm not just talking about journalists here. There's, I've been to dozens and dozens of trials, opening statements, closing arguments by prosecutors and defense attorneys. And the worst ones just try to machine gun out a series of facts and hope they'll topple down on the jury. They'll have no choice but to agree. And that does work sometimes. You know, The evidence will show this, the evidence will show that. But the best ones try to tell, tell a story. Take the juror by the hand, lead them down a series of logical steps until that attorney's conclusion is inescapable. It's not just people who make their living on the written word. In Portland, we have something called Viridian Farms. These guys could tell you about the soil content. They could tell you how many rows of carrots and onions and garlic they grow. But instead, they talk about who they are, what they want to contribute, why growing something and buying something in season is good for the environment, it's good for them, it's good for you. And this all kind of relates back to something that called, it's called the ladder of abstraction by a guy named S.I. Hayakawa. He'd later become a U.S. senator, but back then he was just another Canadian linguist. And what Hayakawa said was, there's a ladder. And its base is something that is tangible, concrete, that exists. This gentleman's left shoe. Right? <laughs> At the top are the things that are most abstract, freedom, justice, equality. Hayakawa used the example of Bessie the cow. There she is. There's Bessie. 
She's a cow in a field. She exists. Above her, we have all cows. Above all cows, we've got livestock, more abstract. Above that, we got assets. And we go up and up and up and up and up until we reach that most abstract concept of wealth. Now, stories live on the thrum of the string that connects these tangible things with these intangible things. And when we as reporters connect what we're seeing and what we're hearing with these intangible ideas, these abstract ideas, we're working in story. My girlfriend loves Don Draper. Right? He's a lead from the show Mad Men. Not bad looking. <laughs> and at the beginning of the show, if you haven't seen it, he's portrayed as a sort of inadequate father, philandering husband, but he's a terrific ad man. And the guys from Kodak come to him and they have something they want him to sell. It turns, it's got a series of slides you pop in and you can kind of click through it and that Bermuda vacation, every second of it, you can expose somebody to. This is 1959. And they're thinking in report and they want to call it the wheel. And that makes sense. That's what it looks like. And it's new and it's glittering. But Draper says that's not going to sell because that's not going to resonate. Since it's not what people want that's in the, on the device, not that they're not going to buy something that's new and glittering and immediate, they want what's inside of it. They want to connect with those pictures. That if you emphasize the fact that it looks like a little spaceship, nothing will happen. But play to those images, and it might. He said it's not called a wheel. It's called a carousel. Now, I'm going to butcher this clip, because I'm going to jump in halfway through, but uh, copyright law. It's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel. It let's us travel the way a child travels. Round and around, and back home again. To a place where we know we are loved. Draper has done is to sell his audience, maybe us, the concept of story over report. And I think of my mother here. She's a neonatologist at the county hospital. That means she sees a lot of very sick babies. She sees babies born much too early or with their organs in all the wrong places. She sees babies from rich Caribbean parents who can afford to fly up here. She sees babies from closer to home. Sometimes she has to tell somebody that their baby's not going to make it. Sometimes she has to do this more than once in a day. Now, let me put you there in that room. The walls are vivid, hopeful green, painted last weekend by volunteers. The carpet is worn and brown. Vacuums were. Machines pop on and off. Maybe you kept the baby, despite the advice of doctors. Maybe it's going to require 24-hour care you can't afford. Maybe you're destitute. Maybe you're grinding your teeth. Maybe you're crying. And then walks this doctor, and she's got on foundation and blush, and her hair's cut short, and her accent's not quite American. You can't make out what it is. And She's got her head dipped down kind of low and she's looking at you, but not looking at you. And you know in that moment what she's gonna say. And this is the time for story. And I don't mean bedtime stories or little white lies. I mean this is the time when it's her duty to connect these tangible things that you can hold in your hand, you can understand with the intangible. When she has to give meaning to a life that lasted 30 minutes, 30 days. By this point, you would have heard from the cardiologist, you would have heard from the neurologist, from the necrologist. You have all these reports flying around, right? Just like the Kansas City Star reporter had, this unseemly mass of information. And she could let that be, that's okay. You can let somebody just take what they have and leave it, but she makes the choice to use story. 
She makes the choice to synthesize all of these seemingly disparate parts into one narrative that we can understand. It's a harder choice. It's one she makes. Since we had cave paintings in the Paleolithic 10,000 years ago, we've been communicating in story. That's how our brains are built. Reports are a much more recent advent. You blame Gutenberg. But if I'm going to leave you with something today, it's this. That we owe it to each other to make that harder choice. To try to communicate in story. Because story gives us meaning.